such a dummy, I didn't press record. Greetings, Mother Factors, and welcome to this especially very far in the past edition of 101 Facts. My name is Chris, and I'm here with a single big potato clenched tightly in my left hand to talk at you about the fascinating history of ancient China. A time filled with words that I 100% pronounce correctly. Yeah, huh? Got every word bang on. But what were parents given after selling their children during a famine? Who built a lake of what to impress someone? If I start talking, do you think I'll come up with a third question? Two out of these three questions are going to be answered, so sit down, don't forget to like and subscribe, and please be nice, I really did try with the pronunciations, as we mouthwash through 101 facts about ancient China. Number 1. Okay, so first things first, when was ancient China? Well, for the purposes of this video, we're going to say everything from 2070 BCE through to 221 BCE, although we might cover a few bits that took place after then too, mostly because some interesting bits happened just outside this period. Number 2. But sticking with the premise of 2070 BCE to 221 BCE, ancient China can handily be divided into three broad periods each associated with the ruling dynasty at the time. So we have the Xia dynasty from 2070 to 1600 BCE, the Shang dynasty from 1600 BCE to 1046 BCE, and then the Zhu dynasty from 1046 BCE to 256 BCE. Number 3. I've said everything wrong. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but let's just say some strife in the Zhu period eventually led to the creation of the Imperial China under the Qin Dynasty between 221 BCE and 206 BCE. This period, despite only lasting 15 years, includes things like the Terracotta Army and the origins of the Great Wall of China. Number 4. Look, I know I said we'd probably stop around 221 BCE, but I reckon we'll also cover some of the Han Dynasty too, and they were running the show between 206 BCE and 220 CE. Yes, yes, I'm sure technically this is outside the remit of ancient China, but look, it happened a really long time ago, and it's super interesting, so we're leaving it in. Number 5. Getting us underway is the Shia Dynasty, and we already have a slight problem in that no written records from this period actually survived. In fact, this is such a problem that some historians have argued that they might not have even existed at all, and that they were made up by later rulers to justify their actions. Number 6. However, some archaeological finds might, and I will stress that again, MIGHT, prove that the Shia dynasty weren't just a mythological origin story. At a site called Early Tu in Yanshi Hinan, several artifacts have been found dating from 1900 to 1500 BCE. It's possible this Early Tu culture could be evidence of the Shia. Number 7. Anyway, now that we've established that the Shia may or may not be real, what were they all about? Where did they come from and where did they go? Where did you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? Are you okay? Are you lost? Sorry. Well, the Shia are said to have originated from several people living next to the Yellow River. Number 8. The origins of the Shia stretch back into Chinese folklore, and the legendary Three Sovereigns and the Five Emperors, prehistorical rulers who were, in some cases, semi-divine. They taught their people about the essentials of civilization, farming, fire and building houses, as well as being models of leadership. Number 9. The founder of the Shia dynasty, Yu the Great, is said to be descended from Xian Su and Emperor Shun, two of the legendary rulers I just mentioned. Number 10. According to stories about the era, the tribes around the Yellow River were getting hit by repeated flooding that was destroying their land and livelihoods, and Yu's dad, Gun, couldn't stop it. Number 11. Do -do 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 scrumfy dumpy dumpy dumpy. So the emperor in charge at the time turned to Yu instead, and since he's got the name Yu the Great, I bet you can see where this is going. Essentially, Yu spent the next 13 years building a load of canals, and you know what? It only went and bloody worked. Now when the Yellow River flooded, the water went into the sea rather than wrecking the land. Number 12. Now the land wasn't underwater all the time. Turns out it was good farming land and Yu's tribe grew to become the most powerful in the region, and Yu was eventually selected to become the next emperor. Number 13. Before we move on from Yu, one of the stories about his birth demonstrates his semi-mythical status. After his father, Gun, had been executed for failing to stop the flood, his body was somewhat preserved in excellent condition. When his body was then cut open three years after Gun's death, Yu emerged from his father's remains. Number 14. However, when it came to passing on the throne to a successor, Yu didn't simply nominate the best candidate for the job, as had happened to him when he became emperor. 
Instead, he kept power in the family, making the title hereditary. As a result, he created the first ruling dynasty of China, the Shia. Number 15. The Shia ruled for a long time, with 16 successive rulers following on from Yu. They had two capital cities during their time in charge, one at Shenzhen and Yangcheng. Number 16. Everything went pretty smoothly until the reign of Xiang, the fifth Shia emperor who was killed and the dynasty looked like it might have been deposed. However, according to the legends, just as he was killed, his pregnant wife escaped and they laid low. Everyone thought the Shia had ceased to exist. Number 17. Gah, but plot twist they hadn't. A baby was born called Shao Kang, and that boy grew up to take the revenge on the man who had overthrown his father. That man was Hang Zhu. Hang Zhu tried to find Shao Kang, sending his two sons to seek and destroy the last of the Shia. Number 18. They didn't succeed, and Shao Kang went on the run. During this time, he got married and started to build support for his cause, a cause that was helped by the unpopular rule of Hang Zhu. Number 19. A showdown was inevitable, and when Shao Kang defeated the two sons of Hang Zhu, his army marched on Hang Zhu's position. Sensing defeat for himself, Hang Zhu took his own life. The Shia dynasty had been restored. Number 20. Sadly for the Shia, though, not all emperors were as good as Shao Kang. The 14th emperor, Kong Jie, ruling from 1789 to 1758 BCE, was said to prefer boozing rather than ruling. Subsequent emperors were also said to be ineffectual, and the 17th and last Shia emperor was supposedly one of the worst. Number 21. That emperor went by the name of Xi, and he was something of a tyrant. His reign was said to be decadent, and Xi was more interested in the company of women, singers, fools, and acrobats. Oh, and he loved to drink too. I don't know about you, but I've recorded the same three facts three times because Audition keeps messing up. His favorite consort was a woman called Mo Ji, who was said to have no virtue as well as being depraved and immoral. But Ji was said to indulge her every wish, including creating a massive lake made of wine big enough for a boat to sail on. Apparently, 3,000 men were ordered to drink the lake dry, but drowned in the process, much to Mo Ji's amusement. Number 23. Another quirk of Xi was that when he got drunk, he had to sit on someone's back and ride them around like a horse. In one incident, he is said to have executed his chancellor for collapsing while being the drink horsey. Number 24. Needless to say, this sort of behavior didn't make Xi very popular, and a pretender stepped up to take his place. He went by the name of Tang of Shang, and he wanted to get rid of Xia and the problem that the dynasty had now become. Number 25. The showdown took place at the Battle of Mingchao, fought in the middle of a thunderstorm, and it was the Shang army that came out on top. Xi is said to have survived the battle but later died of illness. Either way, the Xia dynasty was over, so long live the Shang dynasty. Number 26. Just a quick point of order, it's probably more accurate to say that the ruler of China at this time were kings rather than emperors. But since some of the sources we've looked at have emperors and others used kings, it was a bit confusing. Anyway, what that means is that King Tang was now the ruler of China. Number 27. However, before we say goodbye to the Xia, remember when I said that the physical evidence for their existence was pretty thin? But in addition to the site of early two, other archaeological places of interest include, my god, Jingzhai in Henan, Wangcheng Gang in Dengfeng, and Taozi in Shangxi. Although whether the things found here are sheer in nature is still hotly debated. Number 28. But what about the Shang? Well, we're on slightly firmer ground with this dynasty, since this is the first dynasty for which historians have both archaeological and documentary evidence. Huzzah! Number 29. Tang was a nice ruler, and immediately set about doing good works for his people like reducing excessive taxes and reducing the time conscripts had to spend in the army. Number 30. One eye-catching policy was giving special gold coins to parents that had been so poor they'd sold their own children during a time of famine. The gold coin allowed them to buy their children back. Number 31. The Shang era saw a lot of advancements, but what was their secret? Soil. No, seriously. According to some historians, it was rich in loess, a fertile sediment that there was loads of around the Yellow River. The result was more food than they needed, freeing people up for other pursuits. Number 32. It was a stable era that saw the construction of many cities involving a technique called Hang Tu, or Pounded Earth. Essentially, logs would be used to smash the ground into a hard base by compacting the dirt. This would act as a foundation on which to construct buildings. Number 33. 
Perhaps the most impressive city built during this era was near a modern-day city called Zhengzhou, at a site called Early Gang. This settlement had walls that were 10 meters high and 20 meters thick and stretched for over 7 kilometers. That's like 7-8 miles in old money. All told, this massive wall encompassed an area bigger than 1 square mile or 3 square kilometers in new money. Number 34 it's estimated it would have taken 12,000 people working for a decade to build such a massive construction. Other finds from early gang include bronze weapons and sculptures, and after all, this was the Bronze Age in China. Number 35 The Shang kings had several capital cities, but the most significant was probably Yin, near the modern-day city of Anyang. The capital moved here around 1300 BCE, under the rulership of Pang Geng. Number 36 in fact, Yin became so synonymous with the Shang kings that the entire dynasty is sometimes referred to as Ying Shang. The kings ruled from there for over two centuries. Number 37. This was also a time for advances in learning. The 365-day solar calendar that we're familiar with was introduced during the Shang period by a man named Wan Nian. For a year, he measured shadows using a sundial and a water clock to determine when the solstices and equinoxes occurred. Prior to this, the Chinese calendar had been 354 days long and based on the lunar cycle. Number 38 Also what appeared during the Shang Dynasty's time in charge was the development of writing and Chinese characters. The evidence for this comes from inscriptions on so-called oracle bones. These were usually either the shell of a tortoise or the shoulder of an ox. Number 39 Oracle bones were used in divination ceremonies, essentially so people could obtain answers for the big questions in their life. A fortune teller would write the question on the bone and then throw it into a fire, where it would crack. These cracks would then be interpreted by the fortune teller. Number 40 By around 1250 BCE, a recognizable form of writing was in place. The characters used could be numbers, symbols, or pictographs, and there was a system of grammar too. Since the discovery of oracle bones in the 19th century, more than 5,000 characters have been identified, but experts have only worked out the meaning of about a third. Number 41 But the development of writing wasn't just handy for fortune telling. It helped with the development of science and maths, or math, take your pick. Things like solar eclipses were written down and the idea of accounting began to develop too. The meaning of life. <laughs> It wasn't just all work and no play during the Shang era. People also enjoyed cultural pursuits. Musical instruments have been found dating back to the era, and we know they like to boogie to the ocarina, flutes, chimes, drums, and bells. Number 43. The army also got kitted out with brand new gear. By 1200 BCE, Shang forces were rocking horse-drawn chariots as well as bronze-tipped spears, bows, and halberds. There were even weapons made out of jade, but these were ceremonial. Number 44. Sadly, for anyone going up against the Shang, if you were captured as a prisoner of war, you would likely end up spending the rest of your life as a slave. Alternatively, you could be used as a human sacrifice in religious ceremonies, so, uh, not great either way. Number 45 That's right, folks, human sacrifice was part of the Shang era society, and it's estimated that around 13,000 people were sacrificed over a 200 year period at the capital, Yin, alone. The victims were usually between 15 and 35, and were mostly male. On average, each of these rituals saw 50 people killed, with the biggest thought to have claimed the lives of 339 people. Number 46 There were actually two types of human sacrifice. Ren Shang, or human offerings, saw people killed, mutilated, and buried in big groups. Ren Zung, or human companions, saw people, likely servants or even family members, sacrificed and buried in the tombs of prominent people. Number 47 Dogs were also sacrificed and buried in pits below the bodies of the deceased, possibly so they could have like a guard dog in the afterlife. Some were just puppies and could be buried alive too. Dogs and also pigs were sacrificed to appease the gods of the sky. Number 48. Speaking of deities, the greatest was considered to be Dai, sometimes named Shangdi, the so-called Lord on High. He was said to be the greatest ancestor of all and decided the course of victory in battle, controlled the harvest, the weather, and how things were going in the capital city. Number 49 Problem was, though, that Dai was basically so high and mighty he was likely thought to be unreachable by us mortal humans. Consequently, the people turned to their ancestors for answers and the practice of ancestor worship was born. Number 50 Essentially, when someone died, it was believed they then had divine powers, powers which could be called upon by those left behind on Earth when times were hard. The king played his part too, in that he was considered the main link between the living and the divine ancestors. Number 51 now, remember this next bit, it might be significant in a few facts time. 
the king's rule and power was said to be the result of the ancestors' favour and support from the gods. In other words, the Shang weren't in charge through blind luck, but because they had the divine on their side. Number 52. Two kings from the Shang dynasty who have been singled out for good leadership are Pang Geng and Wu Ding. Pang Geng is the ruler responsible for moving the capital to Yin, while Wu Ding presided over a period of advancement in the arts, as well as more practical stuff like dentistry and medicine. I mean, his rule lasted 59 years, so that helps too. Number 53. One of Wu Ding's wives, Lady Hao, is thought to have been a prominent figure too, who led several military campaigns. Her tomb was found to have multiple artifacts, suggesting she had political clout and wealth of her own. Number 54. Unfortunately for Shang after Wu Ding, it's generally accepted that the dynasty's rule began to go downhill, and things reached a crescendo during the reign of Di Jin. He was considered a cruel leader who liked to spend his downtime torturing people and living a life of luxury while his people paid the price. Number 55. Now, I don't know if you remember the last Shia emperor, you know, the guy who built a lake of wine to his precious consort. Well, it turns out the last Shang ruler had the same problem. This time, the woman in question was called Daji, but likewise, he is said to have built her a lake of wine. I mean, what are the chances? Number 56. Anyway, a lake full of booze just wasn't enough entertainment for Di Jin, and he apparently made men and women chase each other while naked around said lake. There was even, supposedly, an island built in this wine lake that played home to a forest of fake trees from which cooked meat was hung, so he and Daji could booze and snack at the same time. Number 57. Di Jin's uncle, a wise sage called Bai Gan, advised his nephew against such a debauched lifestyle. But rather than take this advice on board, the king decided to take things in another direction. He had his uncle executed by having his heart ripped out so he could see if a sage's heart had seven openings. Number 58. Another of the king's advisors, Mei Bo, also dared to criticize the tyrannical Di Jin and was barbecued to death for his trouble. Number 59. Needless to say, people got pretty fed up of all the naked wine parties and human barbecues. And eventually, Ji Fa from the rival Zhu dynasty raised an army of almost 50,000 to take on the evil Shang King. Number 60. As this army advanced on the Shang capital, Di Jin is said to have ordered 170,000 slaves to join the defending army, but they defected to the other side. When the deciding fight took place at the Battle of Mui, many of the remaining Shang troops also changed sides and ultimately the Shang dynasty was toppled. Number 61. Di Jin wasn't killed in the fight though, and he fled to his luxurious palace known as Deer Terrace Pavilion and set it on fire, where he himself burned to death. However, his body was subsequently found by the Zhu and his head was displayed on a flagpole to make sure everyone knew he was defeated. Number 62. The leader of the Zhu, Zhi Fa, was the first of the Zhu dynasty and he was known by the name King Wu. The dynasty would go on to rule for the next eight centuries. Number 63. Now, toppling a king who is essentially ruling with the approval of the gods is a slightly tricky business to sell, from a public relations point of view at the very least. I told you this would come up again. So it's not surprising that around this time the concept of the Mandate of Heaven was created for rulers in ancient China. It's Nintendo 64. The Mandate of Heaven was a concept developed by the Zhu dynasty in their own lands before they toppled the Shang. Essentially, Zhu rulers believed that their authority came directly from heaven, and when Zhu leaders died, they also went to heaven and served at the divine court there. Number 65. To maintain the support of heaven, leaders were expected to be just and upstanding figures who ruled well, but kings who were tyrants and immoral would lose their mandate and leave themselves open to conquest. If one side defeated another, it was a sign that they had the mandate of heaven. Number 66. It just so happens that the father of King Wu, Wen of Zhu, was the first to come up with the idea of the Mandate of Heaven and became known as the Son of Heaven. And when there was a conjunction of five major planets in 1059 BCE, it seemed to prove his point. Wu, thanks in part to his father's glowing reputation, was then later able to fight and beat the Shang. Number 67. And remember way back when I said that the Shia dynasty might not have existed? Well, some scholars believe that they were invented by the Zhu dynasty to legitimize the toppling of one regime in favor of another. If the Shang took power from someone else, then it was easy to justify the Zhu taking power from the Shang. Number 68. The Zhu dynasty period is normally divided into two sections. The so-called Western Zhu period lasted from 1046 to 1771 BCE and was followed by, wait for it, the Eastern Zhu period, which lasted from 771 BCE to 256 BCE. Number 69. Pigeons. 
In this first half, the western part, the Zhu state exhibited your classic elements of feudal structure, with the king at the top, supported by his nobles, followed by the gentry, merchants, laborers, and the peasants at the bottom of the heap. Number 70. One of the main reasons for this feudal structure was because the Zhu government couldn't directly control everything that was under their power. Instead, they relied on other nobles or family members to go out and run these distant lands on their behalf, and these nobles recognized that the Zhu king was still the high and mighty power overall. Number 71. This system was called Fenjian or Establishment, and was initially really successful. Crops were bountiful, politics was stable, culture developed big time too, and the classic of poetry, otherwise known as the Book of Songs, was written during this time, between the 11th and 7th century BCE. With 305 poems, it is the oldest collection of Chinese poetry in existence. Number 72. The capital during this western period was the city of Feng Yao, which was actually two settlements either side of the Feng River. Zhu territory expanded further east under the reign of Dan, the Duke of Zhu, who ruled on behalf of his young nephew, the future King Sheng. Number 73. Uh, Dan! And while things might have been rosy at the Zhu court, where lovely poems and songs were heard encouraging people to be nice and upstanding, further away from the center, the system of Fenjian began to break down. The lords ruling in the far-flung regions started to act for themselves and began ignoring the king. Number 74. This culminated in the end of the Western Zhu in 771 BCE. At the time, King Yu was running the show and he wanted to impress his favorite consort. It's not like that hadn't ended badly before, or anything. The woman in question was Bao Si, and it was apparently really hard to make her laugh, until the king decided to pull a prank on his nobles. Number 75. The prank involved setting off the warning beacons, making it seem like there was an invasion from some pesky nomads. As a result, the nobles came running with their armies to help fight off said invasion, but when they arrived, they were greeted by the sound of Bao Si laughing at them instead of any actual nomads. The king apparently did this a few times, getting a good reaction from Bao Si, but making the lords of the land ignore the beacons. Number 76. To make matters worse, King Yu had already been married to Queen Shen and had a son with her, only to break up the relationship in favor of Bao Si. Understandably, the queen's father was a little annoyed by this, so he allied with some nomads and attacked King Yu in the capital, and no one came to help the king because of all the beacon business earlier. Number 77. <laughs> Anywho, the capital was ruined and the king was killed, only to be replaced by his son from that first marriage, Ping, who became the first new Zhu ruler. He moved the capital eastward to Laoyang, and the Eastern Zhu era began. Ugh. Number 78. Handily for us, this period in China's history can be divided up again. The first part of the Eastern Zhu era is known as the Spring and Autumn period, so named because of the two state chronicles, detailing events being called the Spring and Autumn Annals. This period was between 772 to 476 BCE. Number 79. The second period begins in 475 BCE and ends in 221 BCE, sometime after the Zhu dynasty, which spoilers had been toppled. This time is known as the Warring States period, and um, I don't know what that could possibly entail. Number 80. The importance of chariots and cavalry in warfare continued to grow, and horsemanship essentially became an art form and an important part of a royal education. Sadly for horses, they were often buried in the tombs of their masters or sacrificed help in the afterlife. Number 81. Number 81. One tomb discovered in 1964 and belonged to Duke Jing of Qi, who died in 490 BCE, was found to have the remains of 600 horses, which had been sacrificed to keep him company on the other side. Number 82. While it might not have been a great time for a horse, it was a good time to be a cultural or philosophical thinker. Between the 6th century BCE up until 221 BCE, philosophical and intellectual debate flourished and there were so many ideas floating about that this golden age is known as the Hundred Schools of Thought. Number 83. Some of the most enduring philosophers and philosophies ever are associated with this period. Confucius and later Mensus developed Confucianism, with its emphasis on having a good moral code via Ren or humaneness, leading to humility, respect and selflessness. Number 84. Other big hitters in the thinking stakes were Lao Tzu who aided in the development of Taoism, where humans should live in balance with the universe or Tao. That spiritual immortality is achieved after death, when the spirit of the body joins the universe. Number 85. 
Han Feizi, meanwhile, brought about legalism, which maintained that humans were basically selfish and always looking out for themselves. So naturally, the best way to control those nasty urges was to enact and enforce strict laws. Number 86 Now given that I mentioned the whole Warring States thing earlier, you probably won't be surprised to learn that the Eastern Zhu period wasn't the most stable. Increasingly, other states, Chu, Han, Qi, Wei, Yan, Zhao, and Qin were more powerful than the Zhu, and the dynasty's power began to wane until it was little more than a figurehead. Number 87 The whole Mandate of Heaven concept meant it was difficult to just get rid of them though, and for the best part of two and a half centuries, these states competed against each other for supremacy. The seminal text, The Art of War, by Sun Tzu, was written around 500 BCE, and was probably handy given the almost constant warfare of the area. Number 88 Not everyone was a big fan of warfare though, and the philosopher Mosey founded the ancient philosophy of Mohism that placed an emphasis on universal love for all people regardless of who they were. Mosey went around the various warring states sharing his knowledge of warfare in the hope that all states would end up evenly matched and realize it was a big waste of time. Number 89 That didn't happen and eventually one state, Qin, began to get the upper hand, thanks to, in part, to the military tactics of Shang Yang, who died in 338 BCE. He advocated for total war, and that domestic policy should be used to achieve that goal. Chivalry on the battlefield? That was for suckers! It was win at all cost. Number 90 <coughs> And it worked! In 256 BCE, Qin armies conquered the remains of the Zhu. The last king of the dynasty was King Nan. He had reigned for 59 years and had virtually no power during that entire time. Number 91 However, the state of Qin didn't stop there. Under Ying Zhen, the armies quickly steamrolled the other six states in less than a decade, starting with the fall of Han in 230 BCE and finishing with Qi in 221 BCE. In doing so, he united China under his rule and he declared himself Shi Huangdi. The Qing Dynasty was born and ancient China became Imperial China. Number 92 Now, the Qing Dynasty only lasted about 15 years, but boy oh boy did a lot of stuff happen. Let's start with one of the most famous landmarks in the world, the Great Wall of China. An initial version of this was built during Shi Huangdi's reign, beginning around 218 BCE with the intention of securing his empire and preventing invasion. Number 93 However, he also wanted to secure his rule internally and adopted a strict form of legalism. Remember, the idea that all people are inherently bad and need to be controlled. To this end, he instituted a policy of book burning. All those glorious philosophical works from the Zhu era, they were a big no-no. Anything that wasn't science, farming, or super practical, yeah, it went on the big bonfire. Number 94 Freedom of speech was massively curtailed. Scholars who wrote books deemed unacceptable were killed. If you failed to turn over a book, killed. Even talking about the hundred schools of thought, killed. Number 95 Only the emperor's troops were allowed weapons. All other regions of China were forced to hand them over to him so there could be no resistance to his rule. These weapons were then melted down to create statues celebrating Shi Huangi's rule. Number 96 Needless to say, there were multiple attempts to assassinate the emperor, which in turn made him more paranoid than he already was. He did things like sleep in a different room every night and became enchanted by the idea of living forever, searching for a potion that would make him immortal. Number 97 Ironically, he died in 210 BCE after drinking a cocktail of mercury, which, you know, tends to shorten your life pretty quickly rather than extending it forever. Number 98 Shi Huangdi still made plans for the afterlife though, and had a huge mausoleum built, and I mean huge. Discovered in 1974, the site covers between 35 to 60 square kilometers and took an estimated 700,000 people to build. Inside, there were almost 200 pits packed with life-sized terracotta soldiers, horses, and chariots. His tomb still remains unopened, and legend has it contains vast treasures, but is booby-trapped. Number 99 His successor, Qin Er Shi, was a weak king, who essentially usurped the crown from his older brother by conspiring to have the will of his father changed after he died. Qin authority quickly collapsed. He was forced to commit suicide in 207 BCE by Zhao Gao, a politician who had conspired with him, but who then threatened to reveal what happened. Oh baby! Oh baby! Number 100. That left Ziying as the next in line for Qin Dynasty, but a rebellion against him saw him captured and executed in 206 BCE, along with his entire family, extinguishing the Qin Dynasty almost as quickly as it began. Oh no! 
number 101. A period of civil strife then erupted, called the Chu Han contention between rival factions for the throne. The winner, Liu Bang, who became the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, becoming Emperor Gaozu in 202 BCE. The Han Dynasty would go on to rule until 220 AD. Oh, so that was 101 facts about ancient China. Did you learn anything? Did I say everything wrong? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, while you're down there, why not give us a like and subscribe? Just because it's fun. Because it's really fun. We're having a really fun time. Ah! Ah! Anyway, wish out. On the screen right now are two videos that you will enjoy with your face. And I know you'll enjoy them because it's got a certified Chris seal of appeal. Anyway, see you next week. Bye.